but really I'm just delaying the worship starting uh, till a bit later. Um, good morning, everyone. Can I get a good morning? Good morning, good morning Mr. Farah. Um, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Will, and uh, especially, especially a, a lovely welcome to any visitors or if it's your first time. Um, this is Regeneration Church morning service. Um, as one uh, reviewer on Google Maps uh, uh, says, one five-star reviewer, uh, Regen is a, a new church serving the city of Monash, gospel-centered, transcultural, and missional. Um, the reviewer's name was uh, Pastor Stephen Tan. <laughs> <laughs> it was six years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, so, you know, if you haven't been here before, so th- those are our three kind of core values. Um, gospel centered is probably the main one, though. The gospel is really what Christianity um, is or should be all about. Um, the message that Jesus 2,000 years ago came to earth, died, and rose from the dead. Um, and that that achieved for us, um, being able to be friends and united with God. Um, Though we do bad things um, and we can never get things right, um, we can be friends and um, forgiven and um, commune with a holy and just God. So, uh, and then the transcultural community and missional just flows out of that. It's such an important message everyone needs to know. So we want to go to the ends of the earth uh, for every single person to hear that gospel message. Amen. Oh, man. Um, Look, I think that's enough from me. So I'll hand over to our worship team and we'll sing some gospel-centered worship songs. Thank you, Will. Let's stand together. Um, And then we will um, go into our praise and worship song. So if, you're, uh, if this is your first time at church, we've been going through Isaiah and um, last week and this week we will learn about God's sovereignty through the nations and that's what um, we're going to sing about, God's sovereignty.
second song is we want to behold our God who is above all things.
Thank you, worship team. Announcements. First one, I think, is going to be from Mia. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Morning, church. Uh, I'm Mia. Mm, today, I'm going to announce that Interest Women is going to uh, be held in uh, fifth, fourth, <laughs> fourth May. Thanks. Yeah, it will be uh, from 8.30 to 3 p.m. at, <laughs> at New Hope Baptist Church. Uh, and you can both uh, attend this meeting at uh, at the church or online. So this interest women is... Um, sorry. Yeah, so this name is... Uh, interest women is took from 2 Timothy 2.2. Uh, at the things you may have heard me say, the presence of many witnesses, interest to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Um, so this conference is special because it's uh, most the speakers are women, and it's from women to women. And it's, um, it has two great talks and a seminar music an interview, book reviews, and other activities. And you can, uh, yeah, you can join them on that day. And also, it's not free. The ticket is, the ticket is from 40 to 80. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next one. You don't have to watch the NBA to watch some dunks. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is kind of, I kind of use this like a kind of open mic night to improve my improv. Uh, so, uh, so um, baptisms, it's locked in. Uh, 28th of April, uh, steps, I'm presuming it's after the morning service. Yep, awesome, awesome. So 20th of April, so what is that in? That's right, two weeks, there we go. Okay, next one, membership class. Um, so... Um, you know, it's natural when you're a part of anything, after a certain point you want to commit, you want to show your solidarity, that you become a member, and that's true in our church too. So uh, take in the details there, that's this Thursday night, membership class, again, talk to one of the pastors um, if you're interested, um, and again, at the end of the service, there's a connect form, so anything you need to communicate with the pastors if you don't catch them today or something. So that, that's something you could scan the Connect form to to express your interest in membership class. Okay, next one. Um, I thought I'd get Paul up, Pastor Paul, to um, share about how Alpha went. And then, Paul, there's also the next one is the Moses slides. I'll get you to talk about that too. I'll use my own mic. Hello. Um, yeah, Alpha is going well. So we've had uh, Alpha is an introduction to Christianity, and we've had... Um, four sessions, and there's two to go, even if someone has not been to the previous ones, um, they can still come to the last two and learn things and enjoy. Um, this week's one, actually, that's the wrong slide, but never mind. This week's one is, uh, how and why should I pray? And um, you can still, that Facebook scan still works, you can sign up and uh, come along. So we have a meal, we have this really cool video, and then we have time to chat. Last week we had some fantastic um, discussions. We had 22 people here. The only problem was, only two people signed up on Facebook. <laughs> so it gets really hard to figure out how to cater. It's like, what do you do, add 20? So please sign up and bring your friends, uh, especially if they don't know the Lord yet. Uh, second one is Mosa. Mosa is for um, an outreach to South Asians or friends of South Asians. And we're going for a scavenger hunt. Um, watch the sunset at Black Rock and then back here for a meal. It'll start at 3 p.m. It's always the first Saturday of the month. So make your plans. Uh, scan that QR code and, and it's on Facebook as well. Thank you. Hey, my mic is back on. Okay, um, I'm going to say something, and could I get you to repeat back and also with you? May the fourth be with you. <laughs> Bit out of left field. Okay, final announcement.
Okay, now uh, I I don't I, I don't <laughs> I can't read Chinese, but I think I think there's f- something about four, uh, four maybe four people, uh, fourteen dollars. Uh, <laughs> jokes, I know about this one. So uh, today is the Mandarin service. Can I get a yeah? Woo! Nice. So, um, as you can see, the service itself is 2 to 3 p.m., but uh, come at 1 for lunch, and uh, something about Facebook. (laughs) Uh, Okay, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, If you haven't noticed, the entire lineup on stage today uh, have glasses on, and Kian will not be breaking that pattern with his prayer. And then Reshma will do the Bible reading after that. Thank you, Will. All right. Well, nothing wrong with having glasses, except, except you've got poor sight, I suppose. Um, okay, so my name is Kiana. I'll lead us in prayer. Um, before I start, um, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 17. Um, Paul visits Athens, and uh, he sees the state of the city, and he's distressed. But he's invited to um, speak to um, the scholars and the religious people of the city. And uh, this is what he says from verse 22. Uh, to verse 31. Paul stood in the middle of Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which it is inscribed to to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim Uh, This I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they, may, they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring." Since we are God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you are a God who made everything and all that is in it. You made the whole world. God, you are the creator. You are not beholden to our whims, to our, uh, to our desires or our, the swaying of our, um, our pursuits, Lord God. You are a God who is before all things and you are above all things. And Lord God, you are a God who is so great but you have not uh, chosen to stay away from us. You draw close to us. You are nearby. So that if we were to turn and uh, reach out to you, we would find you. Lord God, I I pray uh, for our nation, for for Australia today, uh, for our city in um, Monash and and our, um, our, our, our peoples that live here. Lord God, uh, we are in so many ways so ignorant of you. Lord God, so many times we, we desire to, uh, to worship something, uh, not knowing it, that it is you whom we should worship. And Lord, I pray, God, that, that even as you have uh, uh, spoken to the Athenians and said, what you, what you desire to worship is me. Lord God, Lord, I pray that we would be able to turn our eyes and worship um, our true God. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, uh, and, and ask for your grace upon our nation, Lord God, um, especially uh, for anyone who's been affected uh, by the attacks in Bondi Junction over the weekend. Lord God, I pray 
Lord God, even as we are confronted with the reality of sin, Lord God, of the tragedy of, of brokenness of this world, Lord God, we would not despair, but we would turn our eyes unto, unto you, God, and ask for your grace, ask for your mercy, Lord God, Lord, for we are a sinful people. We are an unclean people with unclean lips, and we need more of Jesus in our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that, uh, that you would uh, use um, Regeneration Church and our members, Lord God, to, to be uh, the salt and light to the world, Lord God, Lord, to, to allow uh, your goodness to shine through us, Lord God, both in Monash and Melbourne and uh, to the ends of the earth, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for our mission partners and, and uh, one of them here today. Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that uh, the good things that you're doing around the world, Lord God, through your people, uh, might shine uh, for, the, for the glory of your name. Lord, we also thank you, Lord God, for the Entrust Women's Conference. Lord God, Lord, that there are women in this nation that wish to gather to worship you, to grow in their worship of you. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon um, uh, that, that time, Lord God, that um, those who attend, Lord God, will be empowered um, and encouraged, Lord God, to continue to be your witnesses. Lord, we also uh, thank you, Lord God, for, um, for, the, for the people who are joining in with the baptisms and the membership class. Lord God, I pray that uh, th those who have decided to make that next step in their journey of faith, Lord God, Lord, and their journey of, um, of faith with Regeneration Church, Lord God, Lord, would be um, blessed, Lord God, Lord, as, as, as they see you uh, walk with them. Lord, as they, um, they uh, uncover your, your plans and your purposes uh, for them. And Lord God, we, we, we lastly, we ask, Lord God, we ask for your blessing upon uh, our, our own lives, Lord God, Lord, our own needs, but also, Lord, uh, the, the needs as we uh, desire, uh, desire to uh, bless the community. Lord, we pray for Mosa, and we pray for Alpha, um, we pray for um, the Mandarin service later today, God, Lord, uh, let your word uh, come through those efforts. Lord, let the, um, let the, uh, the people of Melbourne, uh, just like the Athenians, be, be able to hear of the good news of Jesus. And uh, let, let them uh, know uh, the truth about the one uh, they desire to worship. Lord, I pray for our own morning service this morning. I pray for Pastor Paul as he delivers the word. Lord, let our hearts be open to the truth of you, Lord God, and how you've been patient throughout the generations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe it's time for uh, Bible reading, and Reshma will do that. And uh, surprise, surprise, she also has glasses. Thanks, Kian. So yes, my name is Reshma, and I'm bringing the Bible reading. Uh, today's Bible reading is Isaiah chapters 15 and 16. You'll find that on page uh, 598 of the Grey Bibles and uh, 613 of the Black Church Bibles. And I'll give us a bit of time to find that. Isaiah chapter 15. A pronouncement concerning Moab. Ar in Moab is devastated, destroyed in a night. Kur in Moab is devastated, destroyed in a night. Dibon went up to its temple to weep at its high places. Moab wails on Nebo and at Medaba. Every head is shaved, every beard is chopped short. In its streets they wear sackcloth. On its rooftops and in its public squares, everyone wails, falling down and weeping. Heshbon and Elah Ela cry out. Their voices are heard as far away as Jahaz. Therefore, the soldiers of Moab cry out and they tremble. My heart cries out over Moab, whose fugitives flee as far as Zor to Eglath Shilishia. They go up the ascent of Luhith, weeping. They raise a cry of destruction on the road to Horonaim. The waters of Nimrim are desolate. 
the grass is withered, the foliage is gone, and the vegetation has vanished. So they carry their wealth and belongings over the wadi of the willows. For their cry echoes throughout the territory of Moab. Their wailing reaches Eglaim. Their wailing reaches Beer Elam. The waters of Dibon are full of blood. But I will bring on Dibon even more than this, a lion for those who escape from Moab and for the survivors in the land. Send lambs to the ruler of the land, from Selah in the desert to the mountain of daughter Zion. Like a bird fleeing forced from the nest, the daughters of Moab will be at the fords of the Arnon. Give us counsel and make a decision. Shelter us at noonday with shade that is as dark as night. Hide the refugees. Do not betray the one who flees. Let my refugees stay with you. Be a refuge for Moab from the aggressor. When the oppressor has gone, destruction has ended, and marauders have vanished from the land, a throne will be established in love, and one will sit on it faithfully in the tent of David, judging and pursuing what is right, quick to execute justice. We have heard of Moab's pride, how very proud he is, his haughtiness, his pride, his arrogance, and his empty boasting. Therefore, let Moab wail. Let every one of them wail for Moab. You who are completely devastated, mourn for the raisin cakes of Kir Hareseth. For Hezbon's terraced vineyards and the grapevines of Sibma have withered. The rulers of the nations have trampled its choice vines that reached as far as Jaza and spread to the desert. Their shoots spread out and reach the sea. So I join with Jaza to weep for the vines of Sibma. I drench Heshbon and Elah Elah with my tears. Triumphant shouts have fallen silent over your summer fruit and your harvest. Joy and rejoicing have been removed from the orchard. No one is singing or shouting for joy in the vineyards. No one tramples grapes in the wine presses. I have put an end to the shouting. Therefore I moan like the sound of a lyre for Moab, as does my innermost being for Kir Hires. When Moab appears and tires himself out on the high place and comes to his sanctuary to pray, it will do him no good. This is the message that the Lord previously announced about Moab. And now the Lord says, in three years, as a hired worker counts years, Moab's splendor will become an object of contempt in spite of a very large population. And those who are left will be few and weak. Okay, so um, Sprouts can go out with Naomi. Um, and there's like two buds who can just join the Sprouts. And the rest of us full-grown trees make like a tree and stay planted where you are. <laughs> Can you put that back? Thanks a lot, Will. And uh, thanks, Reshma, for reading that passage. Uh, good morning again. If you haven't met me, my name is Paul McIntosh. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Pastor Stephen, who usually sits there. And uh, let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this, your word. And even though it's a, an unusual passage and passage we don't often read, we know you have placed it in Isaiah's heart and mind and in your word that we're reading today for our good and to change our hearts. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to us through your word and, to, and through me for your glory. Uh, please help us to change, to be more like you, and to honor you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So welcome everyone to the second sermon in our series from Isaiah, The Supremacy of God Over the Nations. So this is written by the prophet Isaiah when Israel and Judah, uh, the divided kingdom of God's people, the Jews, they were heading for destruction themselves because they desired the gods of the nations around them. Instead of loving the true God, the only true God, who loved them. Uh, But this part of Isaiah, uh, he's not addressing the nation he is in, Judah. He's addressing those around them. And today is Moab's turn. So Pastor Stephen showed us this helpful map last week. And they say that plagiarism is the best form of flattery. So... I just used it again. Um, By the way, if you're a student, uh, saying that won't get you very far with your professor. So just a warning there. Anyway, thank you, Pastor Steps. Uh, We can see all the places Isaiah will refer to uh, in the next few weeks. Um, And of course you can see the center is Judah. And above Judah is... Jerusalem is part of Judah, Uh, Israel was to the north of Judah, and uh, last week the prophecy was for Babylon, and God said that Babylon, although it would rise to become a power and be actually a symbol of evil throughout the Bible, it would be judged because of its arrogance, and we were warned in the sermon not to be arrogant ourselves. So today, it's Moab's turn. And you can see, uh, unlike Babylon, they were Judah's immediate neighbor uh, down near the Dead Sea. So what do we know about Moab? They were related to the Jews. They were named after Moab. And from Genesis, we know that Moab's father was Lot. And Lot, of course, was Abraham's nephew. And Moab had a love-hate relationship with the Jewish people. They are sometimes enemies uh, in Exodus and in 2 Kings. And uh, sometimes a place where Jews sought refuge, like David's family in 1 Samuel, or Naomi and her sons. (coughs) Speaking of Naomi, the greatest Moabite, of all time, is, of course, who? Ruth. That's right, Ruth. Uh, she even has a Bible, written, uh, Bible book written about her, right? A book of the Bible. And is the great-grandmother of King David. Uh, by the way, if our dog was here, and if our dog was sitting, listening to this sermon, and he answered that question just now, what would he say? Roof, that's right, roof. <laughs> and of course, you know, our dog's name is Boaz, that's right. So, of course, he had an interest in answering that question. So, so Moab was a neighbor and a distant relative of Judah. So it makes sense that actually there's an element of sadness in the prophecy of Isaiah. But the question you need to ask today is, who cares? Who cares? Why should I care about this prophecy to an insignificant little nation that was destroyed by the Assyrians 700 plus years before Jesus walked the earth? Apart from its interesting history and Hopefully, Pastor Paul will throw in some dad jokes just to keep me awake. So the answer, of course, is you need to care. This is God's word. And this warning of judgment was not just for the Moabites. It was for Judah, of course, and not just for Judah, for all who read God's word, including you and me. And the warning is this. Don't desire the life of those around you. 
because they will be judged for it. So we're reading here of the devastating end of a nation. And God says in chapter 16, so if you've got your Bible open, have, have a look there. Chapter 16, Moab's splendor will become an object of contempt in spite of a very large population and those who are left will be few and weak. And they would never recover as a nation and by the time of the Roman Empire, they did not exist at all. It's a tragedy that Isaiah and even God himself weeps over, as Reshma, Reshma read just now, and one we should take to heart. All right, here's the outline as we get into it. Moaning for Moab. Who was responsible? Who would love them? And who will love you? Let's start was with who was responsible. So in any tragedy, amidst the rubble and the suffering and the loss you might see on the news, people start asking, why? Not long after that, they ask, who? Who did this? In some cases, who claimed responsibility? Who could allow this to happen? Who messed up? Who was negligent? Who was accountable? And as Isaiah starts in chapter 15, he lists town after town and misery after misery. The questions cry out from behind the tragic scenes. Who was responsible? Well, the Assyrians... They're the attacking nation, right? But actually, they're barely mentioned in this passage. They're just an instrument, the means of destruction. And of course, it must be God. After all, the prophecies from him. But wait, it's not that simple. Have a look at 16, chapter 16, verse 10. Joy and rejoicing have been removed from the orchard. No one is singing or shouting for joy in the vineyards. No one tramples on the grapes in the wine presses. I have put an end to the shouting. So who is that? Okay, it's not Isaiah. It's obviously God. Uh huh. So it's God who is responsible. But then, therefore I moan like the sound of a lyre for Moab, as does my innermost being. For Ker Heres. So, this is not just a case of God deciding to cruelly end a people, a nation. He hates doing it, it hurts him. So, why does he allow the Assyrians to come? And the answers we actually find as he rolls out the lament. Because Moab thought they were powerful because of what they had. So secure town after town, destroyed easily. Chapter 15, verse 1. Ea, oh, sorry, Ah in Moab, Ker in Moab, Hebon, verse 5. Elile, the list goes on. So where are their soldiers? Their military, the ones who often wanted to fight against God's people, where are they? They tr cry out in tr and tremble in verse 4. They're useless. Then in verse 6, their natural resources, their waters, their vegetation and foliage, it's dry and dead. And in verse 7, their wealth and belongings no longer are their security. They're just desperately trying to save them. Uh, commentaries tell us that Dibon was the religious center of the country. So that's where they would turn to, to their own gods for hope. But there is weeping at the temple in verse 2 and at the high places where they placed their idols. And in verse 9, the life-giving waters of Dibon 
full of death, full of blood. The Moabites thought they were like a bird safe in a nest, in 16 verse 2, but now they are fleeing. And then we find the root of the matter. We find it. Who had messed up? 16 verse 6. We have heard of Moab's pride, how very proud he is, his haughtiness, his pride, his arrogance, and his empty boasting. So Moab was proud of its independence and its military and its religion, its resources and its land. But it would prove to be useless. Empty boasting, blown away by the Assyrians. The blessings God had given them, destroyed. So who was responsible for Moab's destruction? Moab. So what's the warning for Judah? Isaiah is a prophet in Judah. So you can paraphrase God through Isaiah saying, you see, why do you envy Moab, their success and their boasting and their raisin cakes in 16 verse 7 and their grapevines in verse 8, even their gods? Why do you envy them? And they're your enemy and they're my enemy. You're no different to them. Their boasting is empty. They will be judged for it. And so will you if you do what they do. That's the reality. How about for us? All around us, we see apparent success. Our friends, our neighbors, our city, many appearing fine without God. They're doing well. They're successful. They're secure. Regardless of who they worship, and how they behave. But don't envy them, my friends. Don't desire the life of those around you because they will be judged for it. In Hebrews 9.27, famous verse, it is appointed for people to die once and after this, judgment. 1 Peter 4 verse 3, Carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Okay, so... Maybe you don't envy wild people to the degree that Peter's talking about, but it is really, really easy to be misled and to desire the joys and blessings of apparently happy, ordinary people and to follow them and their desires. But they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. <clears throat> so back in the 90s, I was working in Malaysia as an engineer for Carrier Air Conditioning. A lot of you know that, and Carrier is a multinational company. And at that time, because we were like in the Asia-Pacific re region, uh, Carrier bought a company in Perth, and I will call them West Star. And in the company news and newsletters, all we heard was how good Westar was. They were the best carrier factory in Asia Pacific. They got the best quality award. Uh, they even got an award from the Prime Minister of Australia for best company to work for, something like that, can't quite remember. And, and one day, one of the managers uh, there in Malaysia, I call him Phil Jones, uh, he was very excited because he told me he was being transferred to Perth to work for Westar. Uh, they were all ready for him. They even had a car park spot 
with his name on it. Phil Jones. Um, then, actually, I can't remember why, he had some issues and he couldn't go. But a couple of years later, they asked me to consider working at Wester to help improve their electronics. So, all right, never been to Perth. So Sharon and I flew down for an interview uh, to check out Perth, and uh, I went off to the factory, and it was true. It was a beautiful, clean factory. Uh, walked in the lobby, there was this trophy cabinet with all their awards. Uh, the workers were happy. I met with the engineers. That they were all uh, really keen to do well. And they even provided a free lunch. So there was this big spread. And went into this room, and I remember watermelon and all this stuff. It's like, wow. Uh, then we went, I went to the interviews, and they were going well. I got to the final one. And the final one was with the director, the big boss. And I will call him Tony Smith. So he had a reputation of being tough but fair. And he was kind of larger than life kind of guy. So he's a very handsome guy. Uh, he had long, curly black hair. He had this really deep voice. Um, and during the interview, he leans back and he says, so how long do you think you're going to work here? And I'm like, I don't know, five years? And he says, five years? Don't you know, at Westar, we're a family. If you join us, you're here for life. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Didn't really know what to say. Um, I remember after, my friends were telling me, work there for life. How can you commit to work there for life? But anyway, I didn't get the job. So that was all right. Stayed happily back working in Malaysia. So fast forward five years. By that time, I'd actually got a job in the USA, in Syracuse, New York, and worked for Carrier there. And Carrier had a big campus, had lots of factories, had five factories, big engineering design center. It was huge. Um, but one day, I was just getting my car serviced, my Subaru car. And uh, who should I see getting his car serviced? It was Tony Smith. Here I am bumping into him on the other side of the world. And he had moved there to be a director of one of their factories. And it just so happened that the workshop that serviced Subarus also were, uh, serviced Jaguars. So there's, he's there with his like, deep red Jaguar. Anyway, so I just said hello, Tony, chatted, can't remember what we talked about. But you know what I was thinking in my head, right? What happened to the West Star family and being there for life? <laughs> Didn't even last five years. <laughs> what a load of rubbish. It's a lie. And I was thinking, well, I guess when you're that important, it doesn't really matter what you say, right? You're beyond the truth or something like that. So pride is insidious and can easily draw us in. It's attractive. Don't desire the life of those around you. And whatever the world offers you, test it from God's perspective. Are they offering you security only he can give? Moab proudly thought they were doing well, but they were quickly destroyed. Who was responsible? They were. And now they were desperate. Who would hear their cries? Who would love them? That's our second point. All right, have a look in uh, chapter 15, verse 7. So those who have not been killed, they flee. Verse 7. So they carry their wealth and belongings over the wadi of the willows. For their cry echoes throughout the territory of Moab. Their wailing reaches 
Eglaim. Their wailing reaches Beer Elim. They can't go anywhere. How about their religious capital, Dibon? Their gods should shelter them, but no, the waters of Dibon are full of blood. But it gets worse. Because it says, But I will bring on Dibon even more than this. For those survivors, a lion. More destruction. A lion for those who escape from Moab and for the survivors of the land. And now they're desperate in 16 verse 1. They want to give, give gifts to the king of Judah, their enemy. Lambs to Jerusalem, to Zion. Verse 2, like a bird fleeing forced from the nest, the daughters of Moab will be at the fords of the Arnon. It's like at the border. Give us counsel and make a decision. Please, shelter us at noonday with shade that is as dark as night. Hide the refugees. Do not betray the one who flees. Let my refugees stay with you. Be a refuge for Moab from the aggressor. So, Judah. Listen up, Judah. You are envious of a proud country, your enemy. And now look at them, devastated and begging you for help. And historically, there's no evidence that Judah did or could help them. This is the end for Moab as a nation. And where is their security and their gods and their religion? Have a look at 16 verse 12. When Moab appears and tires himself out on the high place and comes to his sanctuary to pray, it will, of course, do him no good. Because his gods are not real. Moab was to be destroyed. And this was not a vague prophecy Verse 13, this is the message that the Lord previously announced about Moab. Perhaps Isaiah had said it before. And now the Lord says, in three years, guaranteed, as a hired worker counts years, Moab's splendor will become an object of contempt in spite of a very large population. And those who are left will be few and weak. And they were so weak that historians tell us by the time Rome invaded the land, Moab, Moabites were no longer identifiable as a people. And a search of the New Testament finds references to some of the other countries that Isaiah talks about, like Egypt or cities like Damascus and Tyre. But for Moab, search for Moab in the New Testament not there. In Psalm 37, David says, Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. For evildoers will be destroyed. But those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he will not be there. Don't desire the life of those around you. They will be judged for it. So back in the 2000s, Carrier announced that they were shutting down Wester. Poor management and increased competition were to blame. Reputation, awards, how much equipment they built and sold couldn't save them. And many people were sad about that, and including me. We were sad. Actually, it was the last factory carrier had in Australia. About 2012, I went on a small business trip to Perth just to meet the carrier service team. And the manager picked me up from the airport and took me to his office. And I realized 
that his office was actually on the abandoned West Star property. So they just had a little small corner in the now vacant site. And he told me they were selling the property soon. Uh, so the factory buildings were boarded up. They were all like rusty and dirty. The gardens were overgrown. There was weeds pushing up through the asphalt of the car park. It was desolate. I'm thinking, wow, I could have taken all the trouble to move my family to Perth, and then we would have had to move somewhere else. Thank God I didn't. So don't desire the life of those around you. And whatever the world offers you, test it from God's perspective. Are they offering you security only he can give? Who was responsible for Moab's destruction? They were. Who would love them as a nation? No one. No one. And that's the warning for Judah and for you and me and even our nations. But we've skipped some verses, right? And there's the, they're the only verses of hope. Let's look at them in our final section. So no one would love the proud Moab, but who will love you? Verse 4. There was no hope for Moab, but when the oppressor has gone, destruction has ended, and marauders have vanished from the land, only then a throne will be established in love, and one will sit on it faithfully in the tent of David, judging and pursuing what is right, quick to execute justice. So when we start asking, who is that? It's pretty obvious there was not any king in the Old Testament who fits these qualifications. So Isaiah was project projecting not three years ahead, but way beyond that time. Way beyond our time. Until the time Jesus fully reigns in his kingdom. He is the source of security that Moab cried out for. But he is the source of security that we can receive and join a permanent kingdom we can enter. In Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 31, the angel said to Mary, Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. He is the one. And there is hope. The only hope Isaiah can offer. A leader who loves us, who is not proud or selfish, and only pursues what is right. We can trust him now. We can trust him forever. His kingdom will have no end. But there's a warning. The good king rules, who rules in love, will also be quick to execute justice. And Jesus said this himself in Luke chapter 21. He says, Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. He's talking about his return. For it will come on those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is, is about to happen. So that you may able to be sorry, so that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And then in Matthew twenty four thirty he says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. 
So how can we be safe and stand before the Son of Man and be part of his elect in his kingdom? How do we know that Jesus will love us? When we trust him, of course, he gives us the benefit of what he did on the cross. So please turn to Isaiah 53. So you're already in Isaiah. So flip over to the famous Isaiah 53. So we're looking at Isaiah 53, verse 5. I'll read Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, our sins. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity, our sins, of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. So on the cross, there was no refuge from judgment, no safety, only the cries of Jesus, taking upon himself the punishment for our peace. So the we who turn to him as our king will be saved. And the proof that he can do this is when he rose from the dead. Because he could take the punishment. And that punishment would destroy us. And as our king, we can be confident of his love and his safety and his security now and when he comes again. But today's passage is a warning for us. No one else loves us like he does. No one else died for us. No one and nothing can offer us what he does, no matter how attractive they may be. Don't desire the life of those around you. They will be judged for it. So as we conclude, consider Moab, destroyed because of their own pride, their own sin, completely destroyed. Their name is not mentioned in the New Testament. But there is one Moabite name mentioned there. It's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. And of course, it's Ruth, the great-grandmother of David and ancestor of Jesus. What an honor. And that's an honor also shared whenever someone names their daughter Ruth. But why did she deserve such honor? She came from such an evil nation. The key is what she said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, in Ruth 1.16, the book named after her. What she said was, Don't plead with me to abandon you or return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. The legacy of the Moabite who was not forgotten was to seek shelter in the true God. The God of Isaiah, the God of Judah, and the God of you and me. And that's our legacy too. And for all who turn to Jesus. But don't forget the warning for us today. Don't desire the life of those around you because they will be judged for it. Uh, you know, 
that day when I got out of the car at Westar, I noticed in one of the car parking spaces, they put a gas meter, a really big gas meter. And to protect it, they put this cage around it. And the cage was kind of jammed up right against the wall. And on the wall, you could see through the cage, there was a nameplate. And it was my friend's name, the manager from long ago, Phil Jones, still on the wall. Because they couldn't get to it because the cage was in the way. So it was a parking spot he'd never used. It was a, a little bit sad and pathetic and even embarrassing if you're him, right, having a name there. But it, it was a good thing he never got there. And it was a good thing I never got there too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you truly are our Heavenly Father. We are your children through Jesus Christ and you love us and you care for us and you want us to love you more because there is only safety and security in you. We thank you for this warning to Moab that we can take to heart, that we should not envy other people and other things and the attractive things around us. They are enjoying your gifts, but one day they will be judged for how they live. And we will be judged too if we follow what they do. Help us to learn that you provide the only security that is true and the only security we need. Help us to think about this and apply it to our hearts this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Paul, uh, let's stand together and sing this last song, Who is like the Lord our God, as we reflect on the words today.
Indeed, there is no one like our God. Good, uh, good morning. If you have not met me before, my name is Stephen. I serve as one of the pastors here. And we've just heard about our God who is sovereign over the nations. But not only is He sovereign over the nations, He loves the nations. Just as He has loved Moab, He has also loved Australia, Malaysia, China, Singapore, Mozambique, all of the nations that are represented in all the faces seated here today is a testament to our God who is sovereign over the nations and who has loved the nations um, most powerfully um, in what we've heard from Isaiah 53, Lord Jesus on the cross. And we come now to a time of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. And I'm just going to read from um, the Baptist Confession to give us some understanding of what it is that we're about to partake in. We see it written here. The Supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by Him the same night where He was betrayed to be observed in His churches unto the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance and showing forth the sacrifice of himself in his death, confirmation of the faith of believers in all the benefits thereof, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto him, and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with him, and with each other. So even as we partake of the Lord's Supper to remember Christ as a bond and pledge to Him and to each other, um, this is a great opportunity for us to reflect on um, our, our hearts in the last few weeks. How have we lived in light of God's holy word, in light of His gospel? Uh, and if there's anything in our hearts that we... Um, need to confess before Him. This is a great time to do just that. So uh, uh, communion is for anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and who has also been baptized in water in obedience to His command. So if that's you, even if you're from another church, it's your first time here, we'd love you to participate with us. Uh, if, you, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're not in that category, uh, we, we're so glad that you could join us this morning for worship and we just ask that you would pass uh, the elements by. Uh, if you uh, uh, need a gluten-free option, there is one available in the middle. And I just invite the stewards to come and distribute the bread and the cup now. Uh, and let's take this time for silent confession of our sins.
Brothers and sisters, let me lead us in a prayer of corporate confession. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is slow to anger and full of compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Savior and Lord. God, therefore, forgives you in Christ Jesus, in whom there is no condemnation. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for your salvation. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Brothers and sisters, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Dear Lord Jesus, on this day, on this Lord's day, this Sabbath day, we remember you and we honor you. With the words of our mouth, the actions of our hands in partaking this bread and cup. And also in our hearts, cherishing you, revering you as our Savior. So Lord Jesus, on this day, even as we desire to glorify you, would you meet with us? Would you work in our hearts by your Spirit? to reform our loves so that we once again be reminded that you are most lovely, you are most precious, you are most wonderful, desirable, and all other loves in this life are lesser. So help us, Lord, to delight in you most of all, even as we remember your great sacrifice for us. Fill us with your joy, unspeakable. For your glory, our joy, the joy of the city and the joy of the nations. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Steps, for that. And thank you, Pastor Paul, uh, for your message. Um, and um, just by the way, um, uh, tonight's sermon will be preached on the same passage, but by my good friend Robert Hickingbotham, so I know what I'll be listening to um, in the car on the way to work tomorrow. Um, so, uh, it's pretty much the end of the service. Uh, we will have a special, once I'm done talking, um, we'll actually have a special kind of mission spot um, after we kind of stop the live recording. Um, so, um, after I do the benediction, expect that actually there's a, a final little bonus thing to come, okay? Um, so, uh, just a quick reflection about, um, this, this topic from the sermon. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that, um, that message of, um, not just to not, uh, you know, envy because what we have is so great, but not to envy, especially in situations where, um, you know, the, the, there's somebody who just doesn't follow the rules, right? And they, but they seem to have more than you. Um, so, you know, some th uh, examples that come to mind for me. Um, so if, it could be, um, uh, you know, this lie uh, can be told when you see uh, a friend or a peer uh, slacking off all the time or playing video games, um, yet they end up achieving, uh, you know, a good score in their studies while you, you're slaving away. Um, this lie is told when, um, you know, you might have a friend who freely enjoys, um, like, porn and all, all kinds of sexual indulgence while, um, you know, you struggle with, with guilt and shame as you fail yourself again and again. 
Um, this lie can be told when you have uh, a friend or a colleague who acts disrespectfully toward um, women, for example, and yet st still seems to have great relationships uh, while you struggle um, with feeling uh, loneliness. Um, and this lie can also be told if when you have a colleague or a boss who um, takes all the credit for things that they don't do when they do a poor job, um, and sometimes they even take credit and receive praise for the things that you've done for them. So, brothers and sisters, um, when that lie plays in your head this week, um, remember this. Remember that we have a saviour who had every reason to, uh, to envy um, and every opportunity to act on it. Uh, at the start of Jesus' ministry, he had a series of challenges posed to him by the devil. Um, you know, 40 days of fasting from food and he's told by the devil, you have the power to turn these stones into bread. Why don't you do that? Um, why don't you throw yourself from a great height and God will be forced to pick you up because you're the son of God. Um, bow down and worship me and you'll have all of the splendor of all of the kingdoms. Even in the face of a grisly and shameful death, Jesus had his face set resolutely on what? On, on that grisly and shameful death, on the cross, because he saw through it to the other side. So brothers and sisters, this week, let, let, our, let us put our blinkers on, uh, let us run the race, not looking to our competitors to see whether they're overtaking us, uh, but instead let us fix our gaze firmly on Jesus and use him as our role model, but also the one who gives us the power um, to fight the good fight. So um, let me uh, now just briefly talk about the Connect form. Um, if that could be on the screen. So um, again, just worth always talking about the Connect form. Um, so there's a QR code. Um, so if you need anything from the church or for the, from the pastors, uh, for example, you want prayer for something or you want to take some next steps, you're interested, you have a question, um, this is the form for you. The, the URL is also listed there. Um, so we'll leave that up. And then um, after we're done with the service, um, there are some free uh, top quality beverages, uh, served at the, um, at the counter over there. Um, so now, um, again, we're going to go into the missions spot thing soon. Uh, but first, let me um, leave you with a benediction. So um, let's pray. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, may the love of the Father, the peace of Jesus, his Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you propel you into greater heights of his joy and greater depths of his divine love now and forever. Amen. Okay, steps. Thank you, Will. Checking we're all good to end live stream. Beautiful. Um,